My name is Ian McLean Crawford. Uh, I was born on the 30th of December 1931. Uh, I retired from the Royal Australian Navy in 1989 as a Rear Admiral uh, and I served for 40 years. I had always been interested in the Navy. I joined at the age of 17, not at the age of 13. I tried to enter at the age of 13, but my eyesight was not good enough. Uh, and to my distress, I was rejected, but I was determined to go to sea. Uh, I lived in Mossman, and therefore we had a lot of connection with the sea. My father had been a radio officer in the Merchant Navy, and having been a radio officer in a, a P&O ship, had come to Australia where he met my mother, uh, went back to England, resigned from the Merchant Navy, came to Australia and settled in Mossman. And therefore I had a great uh, exposure to the maritime matters on either side, Middle Harbour uh, and the Main Harbour. And I just have always loved the whole ambiance of the sea, not just shooting ships and shooting guns, but the navigation, the bird life, the sea life, charts, weather, the whole nine yards, as the Americans would say, everything about the sea. I was a, a supply specialist, not an executive officer, uh, although in the Korean War I was employed more in seaman skills uh, than I was in supply skills. Uh, but. Uh, I just enjoyed my early years in the Navy uh, as a cadet in the training cruiser in the UK because we were doing fundamentally seaman-like jobs. And uh, I, uh, when I went to Naval College as a supply specialist, but we had to compress into six months everything that the 13-year-old entry did because we had already matriculated from school, uh, I just loved the exposure to seamanship, navigation, communications. A lot of those skills I had learnt as a Boy Scout. So uh, it was just, I just couldn't believe my luck. And I admire the people, uh, reverting to the links to the people from the Second World War, who came back with their skills of leadership. Mainly petty officers and sergeants had field craft skills, seamanship skills who committed themselves to bringing up young, young men uh, as Boy Scouts. It was very important to me. Actually going into service in the first place was important because I was influenced by the experience of my father and two uncles, uh, who amongst them had, had first AIF and second AIF experience. And the friends of my father, who I met, who had um, people from his regiment, uh, they were very fine types. And therefore, we of my vintage were just anxious to uh, follow their example. Uh, so we were always looking for an opportunity to serve. And then, of course, when the Korean War came along, uh, as a 17-year-old, that was exciting. Uh, by then, I, I, had, I joined the Navy at the age of 17, served in the UK. This is another story. A lot of people say uh, you were in a Royal Navy ship. But when we left the Naval College in Australia, uh, we served with the Royal Navy for three and a half years because our Navy wasn't big enough to have the range of experience that we needed to produce a well-rounded well officer. So we had three and a half years serving with the, the Royal Navy. It was a marvellous experience. I joined HMS Salon in Malta, where it was working up. Uh, I had come out to Malta in a troop ship from Liverpool to, to Malta, and then we, we were working up with the Mediterranean fleet. We then pro uh, proceeded to uh, uh, the uh, East Indies fleet, where we were to be the, the flagship, went through the Suez Canal, picked up, and this is something that's of interest to people these days, we picked up our Somali seamen and stokers. Uh, and we had a Chief Tyndall, who from the previous ship that was paying off, went, took his uh, Somali seamen and stokers back to their tribes, recruited some more, and had them waiting for us, the new ship coming out, 
uh, in Aden. And we employed them in uh, clearing the, keeping the double bottoms clean in, in the engine room and the uh, boiler room and keeping the, uh, the ship side painted. So that was just a, an aside on our way to uh, Colombo uh, and then to Trincomalee, where we were destined to have two years as the flagship of the East Indies fleet. Uh, and we em were to embark the fl uh, flag officer or the commander-in-chief, uh, the East Indies fleet. Our area of operation was to be uh, the Persian Gulf, East Africa, India, um, the whole of the Indian Ocean environment. Uh, and we were disturbed when the news, or our doctor was disturbed when the news came that we were going to, the, uh, to Korea because he had just signed 600 certificates for 600 alcoholics because we were going to India and that was the only way our sailors could get a drink if they were a declared alcoholic. However, um, we were preparing to go initially on a cruise to East Africa and we were going to embark the CNC and in those days his family came on board as well, his wife and, and, and daughters. And so the sailors on the quarter deck had to be uh, uh, a little more careful about the way they behaved in the presence of the commander in chief's family. Uh, but uh, that didn't happen. On the 12th of July, and my midshipman's journal goes into great lengths how I described the the situation that had developed in Korea. HMS Belfast, uh, a heavier cruiser than we were, uh, had, had completed her commission on the Far East and was to return to England to recommission. And the, the Admiralty was not prepared to leave the Far East fleet one cruiser short. So we were designated to go to the Far East fleet. No mention at this stage that we were, might be going to Korea. Uh, so we took off for uh, Singapore, leaving Trincomalee on the day that a lot of the families arrived. Because having a, a two-year uh, commission on the East Indies fleet, a lot of the families were coming out to live in the family quarters in Trincomalee. Others were staying behind in England for that two-year period. And it shows the great stress that was put on family life in, in those days. However, as the fa many of the families arrived, we took off for Singapore, where we prepared for uh, possibility of hostile uh, duties, uh, we damage control, exercise, firefighting. The ship was refitted. Uh, and to disguise our ultimate destination, we came out of Singapore, turned right up the Malacca Strait, uh, as though we were returning to Trincomalee, and then overnight turned around and headed for uh, uh, Hong Kong. It was top secret that we were going to uh, uh, Hong Kong. But as we threw, came through the Dragon's Teeth, which is the entrance to Hong Kong Harbour, there was Jenny's side party, which was part of the locally engaged people who used to keep ship sides clean uh, for the reward of uh, uh, disposing of their garbage, saying, welcome HMS Salon. Uh, on our top secret mission. I'll, I'll just carry on a bit. We, we, the youngsters, were very excited at the prospect of, of going to war because uh, there we were giving effect to our admiration of our older brothers, for me, for my father and, and uncles. We were going to share that experience. So uh, the families, a bit dismayed, uh, and I pay tribute here to the, the officers and the senior sailors, or ratings, uh, who all had World War II experience. That, that, uh, they nurtured the young officers, the young midshipmen, in, in their duties, recognising that they, the young officers were going on to be senior officers at some stage. These people were absolutely devoted to teaching us these basic skills. Well, the first experience was that uh, we arrived in Hong Kong and we left Hong Kong heading for Sasebo, which was the, the, the port of the United Nations fleet. We had just left Hong Kong when we were called back. And 
what transpired was that um, the Americans had been pushed and the South Koreans had pushed into what was called the Pusan perimeter. And they had turned to Great Britain for uh, help. Uh, the Brits had said, uh, we might be able to let you have a brigade from the British Army of the, the Rhine next year. And the Americans said, we may not still be here. Uh, so the Brits cobbled together from the local garrison uh, a brigade. Uh, and we, in HMS Salon, were to embark the 1st Battalion of the Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders, and HMS Unicorn, uh, an aircraft repair ship, looking more like an aircraft carrier than anything, embarked the 1st Battalion of the Middlesex Regiment and the Brigade Headquarters, and we took off for uh, Pusan rather than Sasebo, escorted uh, by... HMAS Warramunga, which was on its way to relieve uh, HMAS Shoalhaven. And for a young Australian, I was very proud of, uh, to see HMAS Warramunga. I was the only Australian in the ship. I was Royal Australian Navy, but in those days we used to serve under training and uh, uh, on exchange with the Royal Navy. But we, the subalterns of the Argyle and Southern Highlanders, came down into the uh, the gun room, we had seven of them uh, living with us. Uh, and one of them came over to me and said, they tell me you're an Australian. I said, yes. He said, I'm an Australian too. And his name was Mike Cawthorn, and I make special mention of him. He was the son of Major General Cawthorn, who'd been wounded at Gallipoli, returned to Australia, expressed a desire to continue an army career, and of course we didn't have a standing army, we just put together a force for AIFs. Uh, so we didn't have a standing army, and he was advised that if he wanted a, an army career, to go to India and join the Indian Army, which was of course the British Army in India. So he went to India and eventually became a Major General. As was the practice in those days, he sent his son to boarding school in England, a school called Uppingham. When he finished with the uh, boarding school, he went to army school and was commissioned into the Argyle and Southern Highlanders and went to Hong Kong to join the, the first battalion there. So he came and explained to me he was an Australian. And I tell this story because he was killed on the last day that the Argyles were in action. He was an only son. Many years later, I met his father, who was a very distinguished Australian, had been a high commissioner and ambassador, head of our intelligence services. Uh, but his family, uh, the general is long gone, but there are still cousins of the Cawthorn family. And of course he was in an English regiment, therefore he can't be recognised on the colonnades at the Australian War Memorial in Canberra. But, uh, he was nevertheless a very Australian, uh, very proud of being Australian, even though he'd never been to Australia. Our, our captain briefed us, but just really from the outcome of the Yalta Agreement, where it was a divided uh, country, and how when the, the Russians and the Americans withdrew, uh, the North Koreans took it into their, their mind to invade the South. And so there, there is a lot to be learnt about the mistaken judgments that led Kim Il-sung to try his hand to invade the South. Uh, he misjudged the American attitude. The Americans had withdrawn forces from uh, South Korea, which indicated to Kim Il-sung that they weren't interested at all. Um, he also ignored the advice of uh, Stalin and Mao Zedong, that uh, it would be very difficult to prevail in a war <coughs> um, unless you had maritime and air superiority. And they didn't have that. He ignored that. And of course, those two factors were very much, uh, even though we lost more soldiers uh, in the Korean, in the land conflict, it was the maritime and air superiority 
and much of the tactical air superiority, super, uh, superiority came from uh, aircraft carriers that were the, the de de determinant in the outcome of the Korean War. We were, weren't really aware of the, the horrors. Um, we, having landed the Argyles and the Middlesex Regiment in uh, Pusan, we went round to Sasebo to, to take on our naval duties. And these were largely patrolling, uh, to uh, liaison with guerrillas, doing bombardment support of army operations. Uh, we had a very imaginative captain who established a, a pattern of patrols in the islands near the 38th parallel on the west coast of Korea. We used to patrol deep into the uh, the, uh, the, the Yellow Sea uh, in, in off North Korea uh, to, to make sure the, the Chinese weren't feeding supplies across at that early stage uh, and bombarding islands. So uh, it was very, we weren't really exposed to what was going on until after the landing at Incheon, we had, the land forces had progressed to the 38th parallel, and there was a, a pause in dis decision making uh, whether to go on into North Korea. And here again, we have an example of the misjudgment. Uh, the Chinese had been saying, do not threaten our border on the Yellow River. Uh, this was ignored, and a determination was made by MacArthur. To, to progress. So we then became more involved. We went up to um, Chongjin on the uh, northeast coast, very close to the Russian border. We were bombarding there to destroy the port and the rail facilities, once again de demonstrating the ability of uh, naval interdiction to disrupt supplies. Uh, and then our land forces were getting very close to the Yellow River the thought was, the war is over. We weren't too much exposed to the land battle. Uh, I had been ashore on a, an island called Taichongdo, uh, near the 38th parallel, uh, to the uh, west of Incheon. And we could see <coughs> the, the pr primitive way of life there but we weren't exposed to the horrors of the land battle. It was only after the Chinese came into the war that the real horrors uh, became realized. And we had gone to Kure for uh, some relaxation, for a refit. The main fleet had returned to Hong Kong for Christmas. And it was appreciated that our families were scattered all over the, uh, the, the Southeast Asia there was no point in HMS Salon going anywhere. So we were left there, two Australian destroyers, three Amer Canadian destroyers, and um, some of the, uh, the Americans. But the, the main thing was the war is over, uh, back to normality. While we were refitting in, in Kure, <clears throat> the news came through that the land leaders were identifying different uniforms on people and the casualties on the other side. And there was the realization that there had been an, an enormous onslaught from, from China. And we were very quickly put together, returned to Sasebo. Um, the American uh, commander asked our captain to go up to a, pl a place called Chinampo on the Taidong River in North Korea to cover what was expected to be the evacuation of the US 8th Army. And our 3rd Battalion Royal Australian Regiment would have been part of that. At the same time, there was a huge evacuation from the, uh, the uh, Chosun River, or Chosun uh, Reserve in uh, North Korea by the US Marines uh, towards Hung Nam. Uh, but we were expecting an equally strong evacuation to Chinampo. Uh, so we weren't up, our ca captain was in, in 
command of the operation off the Taidong River, and the force sent up there were two Australian destroyers, three Canadian destroyers, and an American destroyer. Uh, and as we arrived off there, and the evacuation was starting, uh, the winter set in, and the snow came, and that was when we really came to appreciate the horrors of the Korean winter. The, uh, it was eventually realised that that winter, 5051, was the coldest winter uh, of the century. Our captain, as I said, was pretty gung-ho and he wanted to take a light cruiser up the Taidong River to assist with the evacuation from Chinampo. Uh, and as the, an Australian destroyer had gone aground and the Canadian a Canadian destroyer had, had a, 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 a boy uh, wrapped around its screw, it was decided too risky for a cruiser to go up, so our captain remained uh, at the, the mouth of the, the river. Uh, but then we, the, the evacuation continued. Uh, the, the main force continued retreating towards Incheon, uh, so there were mainly civilians that were, eventually came down the Taidong River uh, for evacuation. We didn't see them. We, we, they just passed us by and, and kept on going. We didn't know what the makeup of the crews were. Uh, they could well have been North Korean infiltrators. We then, we had been at sea for a long time and we, it was the longest patrol we'd ever done, 43 days. Uh, we had missed out on uh, R and R. We had missed our mail. Uh, morale was absolutely rock bottom, and we felt that we were in the presence of a malevolent force. That was China coming down. No lights on the shore. Uh, it was uh, a very eerie feeling. And initially, we had the determination of our captain to go up the Taidong River. We thought we'd be walking back to. Incheon. However, we went to, um, after the, the completion of the evacuation, we continued up there. Uh, we went to Incheon and uh, the, uh, we were, the whole area had been developed as a, a logistic base uh, because the, the Americans poured their supplies into uh, Incheon, fuel, food, uh, ammunition, and w we were expecting around about Christmas uh, an onslaught of the, the Chinese and the North Koreans, and to defend against that, the United Nations force set up a, a phalanx of artillery right across the, the peninsula and they used destroyers and our cruiser to fill in the gaps in the, in the uh, channels between the islands. So we moved up on Christmas Eve uh, on uh, 1950 to plug the gap. It was cold. Uh, we expected a, uh, an air attack. We expected a, an infantry uh, attack. Uh, the, it was so cold that the uh, lubricating oil in the, light, in the close range weapons froze and they had to be moved every 15 minutes to stop the lubricating oil from freezing. And I should mention that uh, when we were at sea, not uh, lodged in, in Chon, when the spray came over the brow, over the bow and hit the superstructure of the ship, it froze, became ice. And when we did a, a shoot using our six inch guns for, for support of the, uh, the operations ashore, before the, uh, the, the shell came out, there was a shower of ice. Ice had formed in the, the barrels and this was a bit dicey. So before we did any shoots from there on, we had to put steam up the, um, the, the barrels of the, the six inch guns. So cold was a, a factor. Morale was helped 
because, as I said, morale was rock bottom. And this has stayed with me ever since, the importance of recognition. One of the lessons that uh, dinned into me as a midshipman, the, the importance of recognition. The news came through that uh, we had been mentioned on TV from families. We had been seen on, on TV and we were going to get a medal. Now, I have maintained ever since, and I've done many studies for the government uh, on the Korean War, I have stressed always the importance of recognition. It's important for morale in the time of conflict, and it's important for the peace of mind of veterans in their, their later years. So that, that was something I learnt beyond my military skills as a, an 18-year-old midshipman. So uh, another thing, interesting thing about our being in, uh, in John, the uh, sailors went ashore to look for a Christmas tree to decorate the ship. And they found a woman with about 12 children in a dilapidated accommodation. And she was obviously on one of the islands in, in some distress. And that uh, plucked the hearts of the, of the sailors. Uh, we sent ashore the doctor, some engineering people to get fires going, shipwrights to mend the house, and uh, we bought food from the, well, the welfare committee bought food from the, the ship's stock to feed them. And we, the sailors had bought uh, presents, Christmas presents to go to their families. They surrendered those for the children. And I think this is a, a lovely story to tell of the, the, the attitude of the, the sailors to these unfortunate people. I often wonder what happened. Uh, we put a no fire line round the island because uh, soon after we had to evacuate. The, the Chinese onslaught came uh, some time later. Uh, I think it was about the 4th of August. And um, Incheon was evacuated. Uh, it was all the stores were burnt, blown up. We could hear the the concussion from the um, from the ship, and they sent out landing craft full of food that, that our our supply officer had never seen. <laughs> we did very well out of that, but we were the last ship out. Uh, in fact, the the front line had moved further south. 20 miles further south than, than we were, and we continued, continued interdiction firing in support of, um, as it turned out, we were supporting a, a Turkish battalion ashore. Uh, so at the end of that 43 days, we went back to Sasebo. That was the end of our exposure. But um, the situation was recovered, and um, we retook. Inchon, and we were there for the retaking of Inchon in early February, and USS Missouri, which had been involved in the bombardment of Chongjin earlier, um, came, came along. And uh, because of the unknowns of the, um, the channels and the movement of the sandbanks, wherever USS Missouri went, there were two tugs in case you got into trouble. I would characterize it by the, um, the military skills, and I, I'm, I'm talking about all three services. Uh, I witnessed the performance of the destroyers, from, seeing it from a light cruiser. Uh, we displayed uh, military skills, leadership, uh, and endurance that matched anything that anybody else could... Uh, it, bring on. Yes, the Australian presence in the, in the Korean War was important diplomatically, politically, and militarily. We uh, had skilled leaders uh, from the Second World War, and people like uh, uh, Humphrey Beecher, who was the captain of uh, Warramunga, um, Frank Hassett, who was the uh, CO of 3 Battalion, uh, Creswell, who led 77 Squadron, tremendous leaders, and then uh, Brigadier Daly, who commanded the, the brigade. So they brought leadership, 
diplomatically, we made an independent decision to go to the Korean War. First World War, Second World War, we had followed England into the war. We made a separate decision, and that was very important for us at that time, to be seen as making an independent decision. Uh, it was rewarded because we had made an application to the World Bank uh, for a loan. And as somebody told me many years later, when I was working on, as chairman of the Australian National Korean War Memorial, uh, we didn't meet the criteria for a loan from the World Bank. But Truman, so relieved to have Australia committed land forces to the Korean War, persuaded the World Bank to give us that $250 million loan. And that, that was a very important for Australia. So, forgotten war, perhaps, but not by those who fought with us. We were recognised for our contribution. Uh, the attack on Marrying San by three battalions um, under the leadership of later General Sir Francis Hassett uh, was described by the British uh, divisional commander who went on to become the chief of their general staff as one of the finest infantry attacks uh, in, mil in British mi military history he used. Um, so we, we were recognised by Americans and Brits. <coughs> Dick Creswell, uh, one of the finest leaders, wing commander, uh, led 77 Squadron. Yes, I did meet Australians, but the, in HMS Salon, we were isolated from uh, too much contact. We saw the way the ships, when I say yes, I, I, I know the way the Australians performed because we saw the way the ships operated. So we had a, an understanding of the cohesion, the operational e efficiency of those ships. But this is common to all navies. We were very much, uh, as an 18-year-old midshipman, wet behind the ears, the lowest form of marine life. Uh, we were looked after by all sailors who had World War II experience, leading hands, petty officers, chief petty officers. Uh, they made sure that we didn't make mistakes. Uh, and they, they guided us. And I have always looked for the opportunity to uh, pay tribute to the, these, these people of that era. Uh, the army, uh, great people, uh, the, uh, once again, I, I didn't meet them except when we met some of them in, in Kure, but for a very fleeting moment because we were there for a refit and then we were pressed back into the battle again. So I, I did not meet many of our, our people, but I have a great admiration and I know um, the, a huge respect that the British services and the American services had for the Australians of all three services. As a, a midshipman, we were moved around to different positions. Um, initially, uh, I kept watch as a watchkeeping officer in the air direction room. Uh, and once again, leading hands and petty officers make, made sure that we, we got it right. The function of the air direction room was to uh, identify any potential attack on our ship and to also direct uh, aircraft who were providing a, a combat air patrol for the, the force and also to relay messages if we were doing a bombardment of, of any spotting. So I used to keep a, a, a night watch one in three, uh, not as an assistant uh, ADO but as a, the full-blown air direction officer for that watch. And I enjoyed the, the, the confidence they had in, in letting me do that. My action station at the time, at the, the time of the landing at Incheon, was uh, the local air. Oh, no, I was the air direction officer, assistant air direction officer, starboard side, close range weapons, which meant all the Ehrlichens, pom poms, and and the four inch guns uh, to protect the starboard side of the, the ship. 
uh, and there was a feeling of, uh, once again, remoteness from the operation because uh, we were escorting the carrier, HMS Triumph. Uh, it wasn't until we got to the desperate side of the, the Chinese onslaught that we experienced the, the, the real trauma of, a, of a still being watchkeeping, the cold, uh, recognizing the desperate situation ashore, being quite un uncertain about the outcome. Uh, as a midshipman, I didn't have a cabin. I slept on a initially slept on a in a hammock, uh, but uh, when that didn't work, um, I just had a camp bed in a, in a passageway, uh, and that was pretty hazardous. Um, People would stumble over me getting, going um, through the ship. Uh, I had a lot, I hate to admit it, I had a lot of things stolen um, because it was very much exposed. Uh, and the cold. We used to go to dawn action stations. By then I had uh, finished my round of jobs and I was local air direction officer for the, the after pom pom, M3 pom pom. That's where the photographs were taken when we were retaking um, in in Chon. And I had a Royal Marine Guns crew. And uh, we'd go to dawn action stations, stamping our feet to, in, the, in the cold, uh, everybody grizzling. Uh, but they say that the sailor's not happy unless he's, unless he's grizzling. Uh, it was uh, very important. And we made our own fun. That, that, that's another thing we, we did. Um, yes, we were isolated. We were able to pick up the armed um, Radio Australia being relayed through Kure, and that was a tremendous uh, boost to morale. We we could hear the cricket, and we got some of the the British uh, programs like Take It From Here which inspired us that, as we didn't have uh, visiting uh, uh, entertainment groups, we had to make our own entertainment. So we put on our own pantomime, and we called it Take Us From Here. Uh, so uh, we had to pr provide our entertainment. Our chaplain, in very rounded English accent, used to uh, read books from Damon Runyon. <laughs> uh, but uh, the spirit amongst the, the sailors was good. On those occasions, we were at action stations. Therefore, I, I would have been uh, at my gun position. And when we were bombarding um, Chongjin, I was um, uh, in, on M3 Pom Pom. The white out would fire on a forward bearing, and the muzzle would come very close to our um, gun position, and we could feel the, the, the shock of, of the, the, the firing. Um, that didn't do my hearing much good in later years. Uh, but uh, we expended a, lo a lot of ammunition, and we just sat there uh, ready for the air attack. And there were air attacks in, in Shon, and we were always ready for an air attack. Uh, but the, the shocking part of the, you talk about the main armament, when we were in Inchon, uh, after the Chinese onslaught, we used to carry out what they called interdiction fire. And the idea was to fire uh, rounds at haphazard uh, occasions just to keep the the uh, the Chinese or the North Koreans aware that we were interested in what, what they were doing. Well, that disturbed their sleep, but it also disturbed our sleep. And it um, it, it did damage, uh, especially down, down aft if we used white heart. It, uh, it uh, damaged some of the, uh, the superstructure of the ship and released asbestos into the... because we had asbestos lagging and, of course, that... The shock of the, the firing of the guns released that. Uh, the, the, uh, we used to uh, 
move, we anchor at night, but we change our position every time while we were in, in Chon, uh, so that the shore batteries wouldn't be able to take a bead on us. And, and on one occasion we were uh, there during the day. Uh, we had anchored and a shore battery opened up on us. The shells fell short, but we had to uh, get in the anchor and go to action stations and engage the battery all at the same time. And we used a turret and it fired straight over the cable party getting in the, the anchor, which uh, rather shocked them. So um, the, the six inch battery uh, had its impact within the ship because of the, of the shock of the, the firing of the guns. I was back in Australia by then. Uh, after uh, finishing in HMS Ceylon, uh, the, the ship in March um, went to Singapore for a refit, and I left the ship there and went to a, a naval air station in, in Singapore, and that was another interesting experience. And then by a uh, troop ship in 1951, back to England for a year's courses with the, the Royal Navy. So uh, returned to Australia uh, about October 1952 from being away for about three and a half years. And uh, I was in Australia uh, when the armistice was announced. It all seemed because we were getting back in Australia, getting on with our uh, professional careers. Uh, the, not, the Army was slightly different, but the Navy and the Air Force met their commitments to the Korean War from their, their regular formations. As I said earlier on, we did not have a, a regular Army, and therefore we had to restructure the, the, the uh, battalion in, in Japan to become the, the third battalion. And they had to be volunteers. Uh, and they had to supplement that force by retreads from the Second World War and the um, volunteers who wanted to be part of the action. So, and they were engaged, I think, for a period of two years. So they finished their, their time in, in, in Korea, came back to Australia and went back to civilian life. Uh, these were the, the short-term people. They were, came back and said, we've been to a war. And the old hand from the Second World War said, you call that a war? Uh, and that wasn't helped by the fact that President Truman, in order to get his forces committed to Korea, had called it a police action because he could not commit his forces to a war unless it had the approval of Congress. So this is where people undermine the morale of people. They uh, diminished the standing of the Korean War as a war, and that stuck. And that led to the, uh, the people calling it the, the Forgotten War. So these people went back into civilian life, and it, was, it took some time before we had a, a standing regular army. Uh, so Australia was getting on with post-war reconstruction but I, I can remember going with my father to his club and he retired from the Second World War as a major and second command of his regiment and meeting his friends from the Second World War and his colleagues, some of them from the First World War and they said, you've been to all war and I, I had some pride as a, I was then 19 uh, that uh, I was being recognised. The Armistice Day is, is very important. It's an opportunity to re remember what we achieved in, in Korea, the way we were recognised. Is it an opportunity to remember those who are no longer with us and there are those who had died in the war, or killed in the war. Those who have since died and they're only about 2,500 of us left now. And there's a little group, the Missing in Action, which I've been helping with. Uh, 
we have a, a group of families who are uh, haunted by not knowing what happened to their loved ones. And we still have 43 missing in action from the Korean War. Um, we have put some pressure on the government and they've responded by establishing a, a, a project um, for identifying the remains. We are anxious to locate remains, <coughs> some of whom might be in the <coughs> excuse me, demilitarized zone or in North Korea, but we suspect that a lot of them have already been recovered and could be in Hawaii, where the Americans take all their casualties from all wars, and if they haven't been identified, they are looking for DNA identification. Until we brought some pressure to bear, uh, we were a bit slow in getting the, uh, the process for identification of the, the, the remains. And we were instrumental in getting a memorandum of understanding agreed with the Americans that they would assign the same priority to um, identifying using our DNA to assign to uh, remains found languishing on shelves in Hawaii or already interred in the, the cemetery at Punchbowl. So that is important to us to remember those. And of course I mentioned, uh, I mentioned Mike Cawthorn, the Argyle. I think of his family, his extended family. And the other thing we, th we think of very much is how much the Korean government and the Korean people express their gratitude to uh, Australia. Uh, and I had a sample today of the, uh, the uh, COVID-19 masks <coughs> that they have sent to Australia, a great stock of them to be distributed to veterans, their families, uh, and of course they, and I've been told that they are very high quality masks that we, we've been using. But through a number of programs, such as the Revisit program, uh, which uh, the, they initiated in the 1970s to express their, their, their gratitude. The, they offer a, a program whereby a veteran and his wife, partner, guide, mentor um, can have six days and five nights in Korea as guests of the Korean government, staying in first class hotels, um, having tourism, all meals uh, and, and tourism, visits to the battle sites. Uh, which are important battle sites such as Kapyong uh, or the, uh, the outpost overlooking the Marrying San. Uh, and during this time, which includes the 60th anniversaries and now into the 70th anniversaries, they are subsidizing the airfare of the, the veteran by 60%, I think it is, and the, the, the partner by 30%. Now, the, the, they have also cleared for us our people to wear their Korean government's Korean War Service Medal, which uh, was held up initially by the Brits who said, uh, no, we will uh, assign the medals for uh, our people in, in conflict. So it, was, it took some time before we got round to doing that. But they, they have been at pains to express their, their gratitude. And indeed, recently we had a... Um, um, a light rail uh, carriage with uh, uh, pictures of um, veterans of the Korean War.